Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 168, June 3rd to June 9th, 1864. Last week, we covered the Battle of Cold Harbor. This is certainly a mark on Grant's record, however, his strategy seems to be rolling out. Unable to get at Richmond, he's going to shift focus to Petersburg, as we will soon see. For this episode, though, we're going to put the Eastern Theater, or the main theater of the war, on pause. This week, we are going to kick off the Atlanta campaign. Of course, before we do that, let's talk about some Patreon content. Last month here, as we talked about the Battle of New Market, we talked about a movie review. That was Field of Lost Shoes. It was a newer movie. And a pretty interesting watch, I think. And I had some insights and historical analysis on that movie. And this month, going back into June, we will be doing a picture slideshow as we continue with the Overland campaign. And we might do a little bit of a mix of several different locations so we get a good idea. There's a lot of good locations around Richmond where you can look at Cold Harbor, North Anna. Great locations to go out to. Uh, one of my favorites, Petersburg as well, as we get in here later in the month. So we might do a combination of all of those and kind of talk about what stuff looks like today. So if any of that sounds like it would interest you, there is going to be a link to the Patreon in the show description. Those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. They are greatly appreciated. Picture slideshows, movie reviews, memoir reviews. We even threw a statistical analysis in there. So we got a lot of different items for you. Once again, it's greatly appreciated, and the link is in the description. Let's start by going over the armies that will be engaged during this campaign. Much as in the main theater of the war, there's going to be essentially prolonged combat for several weeks, so there's going to be a lot of moving parts. We'll take a look at the Union and Confederate Army makeups, and that way we can jump right into the action. So, of course, we will talk about the two commanding generals, familiar faces in William T. Sherman and Joseph Johnson. In many ways, the defensive-minded Johnson was possibly a good choice for the Confederacy. Sherman, while a trusted subordinate of Grant, has not really done too well in independent command, but he will have a large army, or army group, with key veteran units to operate with. When I say army group, I mean that there will be three technically armies, That will be under Sherman, the Army of the Cumberland, Army of the Tennessee, and the Army of the Ohio, although the Army of the Ohio is really more core strength. George Thomas will command the Army of the Cumberland, which will include the 4th Corps under Oliver Howard, the 14th Corps under John Palmer, and the 20th Corps under Joe Hooker. So we have a lot of familiar faces there. Howard's going to have divisions under David Stanley, John Newton, and Thomas Wood. You remember Stanley having cavalry command back in 1862. He will have brigades under Charles Cruft, William Groves, and Walter Whitaker. Newton will have brigades under Nathan Kimball, George Wagner, and Charles Harker. Harker, of course, you remember, did good service at Chickamauga in the Snodgrass Hill region. Wood will have August Villick, the Stout Hazen, and Samuel Beatty. Palmer is going to have Richard Johnson, Jefferson C. Davis, and Absalom Baird as division commanders, all having been in our story before. Johnson is going to have brigades under William Carlin, John King, and Benjamin Scribner. Davis will have James Morgan, John Mitchell, and Daniel McCook. Morgan was a former merchant sailor and has served in militias, during conflicts leading up to the war. Despite being present for Island Number 10, he has essentially been in reserve at Nashville for some campaigns here in our sub-theater. Mitchell was a lawyer who had joined the Ohio Reserves and will rise to the ranks. Post-war, he's going to be married to the niece of Rutherford B. Hayes. Baird has Churchin, Vanderveer, and George Est. For Hooker and the 20th Corps, 
He will have division commanders in Alpheus Williams, John Geary, and Daniel Butterfield. Williams will have Knipe, Thomas Ruger, and James Robinson. Gary is going to have familiar names in Charles Candy, Adolphus Bushbeck, and David Ireland. You remember some of these names even from Gettysburg and their service in the Culps Hill region. Butterfield is going to have Benjamin Harrison, John Coburn, and James Wood as brigade commanders. Harrison is the grandson of William Henry Harrison and will become the 23rd President of the United States. Coburn was a politician from Indiana and will go on to become a representative in the House from that state. Wood was also a politician from New York and will serve in the state legislature. The Army of Tennessee will be under James McPherson, the 15th Corps under Black Jack Logan, the 16th under Grenville Dodge, and the 17th under Francis P. Blair. Logan has division commanders under Osterhaus, Morgan Smith, John Smith, and William Harrow. Now Harrow, we have sort of met before. He used to command the 14th Indiana under Nathan Kimball, serving in some of the Western Virginia campaigns, and actually attacking the Sunken Road, and commanding at Gettysburg as well. He will go on to serve in local politics in Indiana, being a lawyer before the war. Osterhaus has brigade commanders which include Charles Woods and James Williamson. Woods was a West Pointer who actually was supposed to lead the reinforcements to Fort Sumter. Williamson we have also met before, earning a Medal of Honor following his wounding at Chickasaw Bayou. Morgan Smith has Giles Smith and Joseph Lightburn. Lightburn was a minister and actually a good friend of Stonewall Jackson, having settled in West Virginia. Post-war, he's going to return to that calling. John Smith has Green Rom, Charles Matthews, and Jesse Alexander. Rom will go on to be a commissioner for the Internal Revenue Service, so obviously he's the bad guy in this lineup, while Matthews was a Prussian, having served in that country before immigrating to Iowa, already having fought at Iuka and Corinth. Finally, Harrow has Reuben Williams, Charles Walcutt, and John Oliver. Walcutt was a first cousin of Davy Crockett and will go on to be the warden of the Ohio State Penitentiary. Oliver led a regiment at Shiloh and will go on to practice law after the war. Dodge has divisions under Charles Sweeney, who we met all the way back at Wilson's Creek, and James Veach. Veach had a grandfather who fought at King's Mountain during the American Revolution and has been in our story since Fort Donelson, commanding a regiment there. Sweeney's brigade commanders will include Elliot Rice, Patrick Burke, and Moses Bain. Rice was a lawyer and has fought since Belmont. If you remember, that was Grant's first battle. Burke was an Irish immigrant, settling in St. Louis, practicing law, and being active in the anti-slavery initiatives there. Veach has John Fuller, John Sprague, and James Howe. Fuller was a British-born general we actually met during the Iuka and Corinth campaigns. Sprague was a businessman before the war and will receive the Medal of Honor during this campaign. Howe will go on to be a federal judge appointed during the Grant administration. Blair gets divisions from Mortimer Leggett and Walker Gresham. Gresham will go on to serve in the cabinets of Chester A. Arthur and Grover Cleveland. Leggett has brigades under Manning Force, Robert Scott, and Adam Mallory. Force commanded the 20th Ohio and was a lawyer before the war, actually having graduated from Harvard. Scott will go on to be the first governor of South Carolina post-Reconstruction. Mallory was an Irish immigrant who served in the pre-war army and will go on to help with Reconstruction in Texas. Now I'm not going to dive too much into the Army of Ohio, as most of the action that we will be talking about is going to be revolving around the Army of the Cumberland and the Army of Tennessee. But just know that John Schofield and Jacob Cox are both going to command that sector. Schofield will have initial divisions under the already mentioned Cox, Alvin Hovey, Henry Judah, and cavalry under George Stoneman, so familiar faces. The overall cavalry command will be under Washington Elliott, 
with divisions under Edward McCook, Kenner Garrard, and Judson Kilpatrick. Elliott was a West Pointer who hitched his wagon with Pope earlier in the war. Garrard was a cavalryman before the war and already served in the East, notably at Gettysburg, taking over for Weed when he was killed at Little Round Top. In all, the Union forces are going to total more than 100,000, putting them slightly on par with Grant and his forces in the main theater, especially as the campaigning begins. What we will see in our story moving forward, however, is that while Grant is going to go headlong at Lee in the east, Sherman is going to take a very different approach to confronting the Confederates, maybe taking more lessons from Vicksburg than his superior. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but there is a constant debate over whether Sherman or Grant conduct the better campaign in 1864. Obviously, Grant is seeing a tremendous amount of casualties, whereas Sherman will see relatively little. There's no wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor even, really, out of any of the battles that Sherman is going to fight. Closest you could probably come are some of the actions when Hood takes over around Atlanta or Kennesaw Mountain, but they're just not going to be on par with those larger-scale engagements. So there's constantly a debate of whether Grant or Sherman are the genius, are they both not geniuses, are they actually, you know, both far above the Confederates they were facing. Well, obviously Lee is on the one scale, so that's going to tip that for the main theater versus Joe Johnson. Was Joe Johnson actually a good general? There are all these questions that you see as you dive into the source material for this campaign, and hopefully we'll be doing a good job moving forward of presenting everything fairly. But speaking of the Confederates, we will have a corps under William Hardy, who has recently returned to the Army, John Bell Hood's Corps, and a corps also known as the Army of the Mississippi under Leonidas Polk. Hardy will have divisions under the already mentioned Ben Cheatham, Pat Claiborne, William Bate, and Shot Patch Walker. Cheatham will be back to command his Tennessee boys with brigades under Maney, Otho Straw, John C. Carter, and Alfred Vaughn. Carter was a University of Virginia grad who practiced law before the war in Tennessee and entered the conflict commanding a regiment from that state. Claiborne will have his usual suspects as well under Daniel Govan, Lucius Polk, Mark Lowry, and Hiram Granberry. Bate would have brigades under Thomas Benton Smith, Joseph Lewis, who is going to be commanding the Orphan Brigade, and Jesse Finley commanding the Floridians. Walker will have Hugh Mercer, States' Rights Gist, John Jackson, and Clement Stevens. Stevens had worked as a seaman before the war and actually designed the ironclad battery that pounded Fort Sumter. Hood, while new to the Army, would have moderately capable division commanders in Thomas Hindman, Carter Stevenson, and Alexander Stewart. Although, to be fair, if we are pointing out who in that list is the most competent, or probably on the back end with Alexander Stewart as opposed to Hyman and Stevenson. Hyman will have brigades under Edward Walthall, Zach Dees, Arthur Manigault, and Matthew Tucker. Tucker would practice law after the war and would actually be murdered in Mississippi. Stevenson would have John C. Brown, Alfred Cumming, Alexander Reynolds, and Edwin Pettus. Pettus will go on to be a senator from Alabama and also a Grand Wizard of the KKK at one point. Stewart will have brigades under Marcellus Stovall, Henry Clayton, Randall Gibson, and Alpheus Baker. Polk will have divisions under William Wing Loring, Samuel French, and James Canty. Canty served in the Mexican-American War prior to the conflict. Loring will have mostly Mississippi troops, with brigades from Winfield Scott Featherston, John Adams, and Alabama troops under Michael Scott. French has Matthew Ector and his mixed Texans and Tar Heels, Francis Cockrell and his Missouri contingent, and Claudius Spears and a brigade of Mississippi troops. Canty has an Arkansas brigade under Daniel Reynolds, his own brigade, and a mixed outfit under William Quarles. Reynolds was a lawyer from Arkansas before the war. Cavalry, of course, will be under Joe Wheeler, with divisions under William Martin, young John Kelly, William Humes, and Red Jackson. Overall, Johnson will be relatively on par with Lee in the East. 
his numbers being around 66,000 swung to maybe as many as 80,000 when Hood gears up offensively. Much like Lee, though, there's going to be not a whole lot of opportunity for reinforcement, however. The Confederates would, however, be able to at least be reinforced with 3,000 or so Georgia militia commanded by Gustavus Smith. If you recall Smith, from all the way back in 1862. They would not be getting help from Longstreet nor Beauregard, though, as all those troops were occupied. Once again, I will bring your attention to the overall plan for Grant. Sherman would be let loose on Atlanta. Hopefully Mobile would be pressed upon at some point, and Lee would be bottled up by three armies in Virginia. A general offensive will not allow the Confederates to shift forces, hopefully eliminating their field armies and capture their industrial centers and bases for supply. If you remember back in the winter, we talked about Thomas and his Army of the Cumberland pressing Joe Johnson and his forces. Johnson had set up defensively at a place called Rocky Face Ridge. The Battle of Dalton was a really a series of probes by Thomas to support Sherman as he marched on Meridian in Mississippi. Rocky Face Ridge was going to be a tougher nut to crack, as Johnson had plenty of time to improve the defenses. Sherman had correctly assessed that Johnson would not act offensively. Johnson referred to his army as what was left from Missionary Ridge, so that was a pretty good call by Sherman. Obviously, that kind of verbiage would indicate that he does not think very highly of the forces he has available. Snake Creek Gap, which was one of the gaps in the ridge, was undefended inexplicably, though. As a result, Sherman, who had gathered in his forces, would plan to pin Johnson using Thomas, and then the Army of Tennessee would flank and exploit this gap. The goal would be to move through the gap and capture Rosaka, a key stop on the railroad. From there, although the country was unfamiliar to Sherman, it would be harder to form any kind of defense for Johnson, at least until he got to the outskirts of Atlanta. Johnson, for his part, spent a lot of time trying to become familiar with the terrain. I know I am usually critical of Johnson, however, in a situation where he is being pushed to act offensively, he does a good job, and that would be a tough ask considering what he has available. As May 1864 loomed into view, his left wing was guarded by Hood, who takes over Breckinridge's old corps and Hardy on the left. Polk and his Army of Mississippi would be on the way, Johnson having wired Richmond that offensive action by the Federals was going to be imminent. Davis, who, remember, is not a fan of Johnson, will brush this aside, considering this intel to be false. Why exactly Davis thought Sherman was not moving on Atlanta was curious, especially as Thomas's three corps got into position to press the center of the Confederate lines. Schofield and his Department of the Ohio would be on the left flank, like McPherson and the Army of Tennessee would be swinging wide to the south and west to gain the gap and force the rebel army out of Dalton. Dalton being a rail hub passing beyond Rocky Face Ridge, this would be important for Sherman to hold in order to keep his army supplied. We're going to see this pretty frequently, I think, in the Atlanta campaign as well, just to mention where the army of the Cumberland is going to hold the Confederates in place, and then the other two armies are going to be acting as your flanking forces. So the Army of Tennessee is going to be the heavy hitter, and then if they need to, they're going to also utilize Schofield and the Army of the Ohio. But that's going to be pretty much the game plan here moving forward, so keep that in mind. May 7th would mark the opening of the campaign, with Jefferson Davis's command advancing on Tunnel Hill, a little north of the main rebel line. Indeed, we may have mentioned Tunnel Hill before when we talked about the Great Locomotive Chase, as this rail line, the Western and Atlantic Railroad, was the one leading to Chattanooga, and where those events occurred. Tunnel Hill was occupied by rebel cavalry from Joe Wheeler's command, and the tunnel was actually intact, something that might have been a big hindrance for Sherman if he hoped to supply his campaign. Unfortunately, though, the Confederates did not have that foresight. Faced with large amounts of infantry, the rebel cavalry would skirmish for some time, but ultimately be forced to withdraw. May 8th would see, then, the Federal forces trying to find a weak spot on Rocky Face Ridge, also demonstrating while McPherson conducts his flanking march through Snake Creek Gap. 
Newton would send Harker's brigade on a mission to capture the northern crest of the ridge, but due to the terrain, the troops would make little headway. Although the 125th Ohio under Emerson Updike would be able to gain high ground, which would be useful for a signal station. At Mill Creek Gap, the rebels had dammed up the creek and flooded the road, blocking any federal advance. Further down the ridge, John White Geary's command would press on Doug Gap. Men from Charles Candy and Adolphus Bushback would attack Kentucky Cavalry and the 1st and 2nd Arkansas. As a result, they would be fairly bloodily repulsed, with a third of the number being coming casualties. The good news for the Federals, however, was that McPherson had successfully pulled through the gap. Though McPherson had some 24,000 men, now in the relative rear of Johnson's army, he also did not have cavalry with him. Instead, he would use some mounted infantry from Grenville Dodge's command. Remember that it is important for an army in the Civil War to have their mounted arm as the kind of eyes and ears. Uh, we talked about Jeb Stewart a lot that way with the Army of Northern Virginia, where Lee is able to use him for intelligence gathering purposes. Well, if McPherson is becoming in the rear of the Confederate Army, then that's going to be a problem if he doesn't know what's in front of him. This mounted infantry that he will use as pseudo cavalry will run into rebel troopers and withdraw as a result. McPherson would move cautiously, not really sure what was in his front. What was there was a single brigade from James Canty arriving from Rome, Georgia, with Polk's command now starting to show up. They would start entrenching at Resaca and skirmishing with the advanced elements of the Army of Tennessee. McPherson would send word to Sherman that he had failed to reach the objective in time, actually withdrawing all the way to the Gap, which should not make Cump very happy at all. Johnson would withdraw his army from their defenses at Rocky Face Ridge and fortify the area around Resaca, which, as we mentioned, was a key spot on the railroad. Sherman's troops would either remove to follow McPherson or simply advance on Dalton now that the Confederates were gone. At the cost of relatively little casualties, the Union Army had hurdled a pretty massive obstacle. Why did Johnson not pick at the gaps that ultimately were used to get around Rocky Face Ridge? Well, again, we really do not know, but I have seen him pointed out that Joe Wheeler and the cavalry were particularly at fault. Whether that is fallout from the cavalry's overall poor performance during the Chickamauga and Chattanooga campaigns, I'm not really sure. But what is clear is that someone definitely blundered on the part of the Confederacy. The next obstacle was going to be Resaca itself. Johnson was joined by Polk's army and would be in quite the new position to blunt Sherman's advance. His defenses were still arrayed on a ridge line. If you look at a map, it's kind of like the Union defense at Gettysburg, a kind of fish hook with Hood on the top, Hardy in the middle, and Polk on the southern end. All of Sherman's armies would be present on the field, with Howard and his 4th Corps to the north, Schofield, Palmer, Hooker, and Logan arrayed from north to south, facing off against the Confederates, who had taken refuge behind Camp Creek. The end of the Confederate line was anchored on the Ostinala River, so Sherman, true to his tactics during this campaign, would wish to flank his enemy out of the position. He would tap on Sweeney's division to use a ferry and cross the waterway, and in the meantime, he would hold Joe's attention with attacks all along his line. Schofield's Corps, as well as Howard's, would be thrown into action on May 14th. Palmer's Corps would suffer from ineffectual charges from Henry Judah's division. Judah, who would be replaced after this battle, will throw his command in an unorganized way, a charge into swampy terrain that would see his command take on heavy casualties and carry portions of Palmer with it. There were also accounts of soldiers being waist deep in mud and water, so poor was the area in which they were attacking. Jacob Cox's division would sweep forward, having better terrain, but would be repulsed at the first line of rebel earthworks. Taking the first line, he would take on heavy fire from the Confederates as his attack was unsupported. Thomas would realize that the gaps in the line would be an issue and tap on Hooker to move forward and slide into the line to assist. Johnson, meanwhile, would recognize that in the northern part of the Union line, their flank was in the air. He would call on John Bell Hood to use Hindman and Stewart to counterattack the position, scattering units from Stanley in the process. 
Stanley's flank was in fact in the air, and Carter Stevenson's command would overlap him easily. The 5th Indiana Battery would stand in the way of the assaulting rebels and make a desperate stand against the large number of Southerners, who at one point were overlapping them as well. Hooker's troops would arrive just in time to push the Confederates back, the Hoosiers having successfully stalled the attack long enough. Johnson, though, would see the partial success that the attack had and call for one the next day. Eventually, though, he would call it off, thinking better of it. The first day at Resaca would end with both sides seeing little in terms of gains, but the Federals on the right had made some advances, gaining high ground that overlooked the Confederate works and the railroad beyond in front of Polk. The 12th Missouri, a regiment that was raised by Osterhaus himself, would be one of the units who captured this position. Polk would try to counterattack in the evening, but the assault would gain little, the Federals still in possession of the high ground that forced him to pull his line back out of range of potential Union guns. In the meantime, Sweeney had been timid in crossing the river, believing that a large force of Confederates had been sent to crush his command. Johnson had been made aware and was trying to divert troops. On the 15th, the fighting would resume along the line. In Hood's sector, artillery had been placed in an advanced position. The battery would become a target of Gary's men. The 78th Indiana, led by future President Benjamin Harrison, would assault the pieces and drive off the rebels, many of the gunners falling in hand-to-hand combat. The pieces would remain in a kind of no-man's land for a time, both sides calling the other to try to take them. The Hoosiers, under the cover of darkness, would dig through the earthworks and drag away the cannon as prizes that evening. By that point, though, the Confederate army was in retreat, and therefore did not want to risk bringing on any more skirmishing. Hood and Johnson would argue after the war about the cannon, which Hood believed were obsolete, and Joe Johnson believed were the only pieces he lost during the campaign. Sweeney, by this time, had been able to cross the river, and long last had been supported by Union cavalry. Johnson had sent Shot Pouch Walker to check any deeper incursions, but with the Union army threatening the railroad once again, he would be forced to withdraw from Resaca. Using corn stalks to mask the amount of noise that the Confederate retreat would make, he would pull out. I have seen some sources place the Battle of Resaca as maybe the second highest casualty count during the campaign, with 3,500 Union troops approximately becoming casualties compared to 2,600 rebels. So you see just how different it is from the Overland campaign. These are skirmish numbers, shall we say. It's more like North Anna than if anything else than Cold Harbor or a wilderness or Spotsylvania or Petersburg assaults, the initial assaults anyway. So you see what I mean when I see the numbers are just a little bit lower. Johnson would withdraw his army toward Adairsville, several miles south of Resaca. From there, he had tried in vain to set up a trap for Sherman. Two roads would lead in different directions, one to Kingston and one to Cassville. Johnson was in a portion of his force in one direction, hoping Sherman would divide his army, which he did. Hood and Polk could isolate Hooker and potentially destroy him, but Federal cavalry would uncover the plot, and so it had to be called off. The affair at Cassville, as it would be called after the war, was also a point of contention for Johnson and Hood. Johnson, of course, was going to blame Hood for not springing the trap, but Hood had grown fearful of Union troops falling on his flank, the cavalry under Daniel McCook being the leading elements. While there are those who believe faulty intelligence might have been the problem, there are those who also side with Hood and believe him to be correct. There's not very many opportunities that the Confederates are going to get during especially the early stages of the Atlanta campaign here. So, Hood not taking this opportunity that might have been at least a fairly decent one seems to be elevated in certain sources. And of course, really, if you're looking at it collectively, Hood becomes extremely aggressive, some say borderline reckless, as he takes control of the army that we'll get to in a future episode. So, why not spring this trap where you can at least isolate part of Sherman's army? You might not get him to retreat all the way back to Chattanooga, but you might at least be able to inflict some damage that is going to hinder him in the long run when he tries to besiege Atlanta.
In the meantime, the Federal artillery would make the Cassville line untenable, and so Johnson would continue the retreat. At some points, the rebel line would be inflated, which would be a problem. Johnson would anchor his new line around Altoona and extend toward Dallas. Sherman had actually been stationed in the area as a young man, so he was familiar and for the first time would deviate from the railroad, moving away from Altoona Pass, which combined with high ground might have been an issue. Instead, he would swing to the west. Hooker on May 25th would run into Hood and Hardy at a place called New Hope Church. Howard would not be able to arrive in time to assist Hooker, whose command would attack and trench Confederates under A.P. Stewart. Stewart had proudly told Johnson that his men would hold the line. The objective was to get at Marietta and destroy the rebel supplies in that direction. But setting up at Dallas, the rebels were blocking the advance. If the flanking movements would become successful, but also Sherman was satisfied with drawing the rebels simply away from Alatoona, and thus getting by a major obstacle yet again. On the 25th, the Federals were run into two regiments of Alabama troops, supported by sharpshooters. Williams and Butterfield will both be called to assault, but the attack would be delayed. Confederates were thus able to easily repulse them. At the cost of some 1,300 Union casualties, the Rebels only lost a couple hundred. Sherman would try to find and turn the right flank of the Rebels on the 27th at a place called Pickett's Mill. Wood's division would be the lead element of this assault, with the stalwart William Babcock Hazen in the lead. Because of John Kelly's Confederate cavalry, the supports for Hazen would be removed. As a result, his command would run directly into Pat Claiborne. Brigades under Benjamin Scribner and Nathaniel McLean would be the lead elements of this assault, and at a cost of 1,600 men, the Confederates would again lose only 400, repulsing the Federals. Ambrose Pierce would be present on the field and write the crime at Pickett's Mill. We have an excerpt here. I observed this phenomenon at Pickett's Mill. Standing at the right of the line, I had an unobstructed view of the narrow open space across which the two lines fought. It was dim with smoke, but not greatly obscured. The smoke rose and spread in sheets among the branches of the trees. Most of our men fought kneeling as they fired, many of them behind trees, stones, and whatever they could else get. But there were considerable groups that stood. Occasionally one of these groups, which had endured the storm of missiles for moments without perceptible reduction, would push forward, moved by a common despair, and wholly detach itself from the line. In a second, every man of the group would be down. There had been no visible movement of the enemy. No audible change in the awful, even roar of the firing, yet all were down. Frequently, the dim figure of an individual soldier would be seen to spring away from his comrades, advancing alone toward their fateful interspace with leveled bayonet. He got no farther than the farthest of his predecessors. Of the hundreds of corpses within 20 paces of the Confederate line, I venture to say that a third were within 15 paces, and not one within 10. Is the perception, perhaps unconscious, of this inexplicable phenomenon that causes the still unharmed, still vigorous, still courageous soldier to retire without having come into actual contact with his foe? He sees or feels that he cannot. His bayonet is a useless weapon for slaughter. Its purpose is a moral one. Its mandate exhausted, he sheathes it and trusts it to the bullet. That failing, he retreats. He has done all that he could with such appliances as he has. No command to fall back was given. None could have been heard. Man by man, the survivors withdrew at will, shifting through the trees into the cover of the ravines. Among the wounded, who could drag themselves back, among the skulkers, whom nothing could have dragged forward. The left of our short line had fought at the corner of a cornfield, the fence along the right side of the which was parallel to the direction of our retreat. As the disorganized groups fell back along this fence, on the wooded side, they were attacked by a flanking force of the enemy, moving through that field in a direction nearly parallel with what had been our front. This force, I infer from Johnson's account, consisted of the brigade of General Lowry, or two Arkansas regiments under Colonel Bauckham. 
I had been sent forward by General Hazen to that point and arrived in time to witness the formidable movement. But already our retreating men, in obedience to their officers, their courage, their and their instinct of self-preservation, had formed along the fence and opened fire. The apparently slight advantage of the imperfect cover and the open range worked its customary miracle. The assault, a singularly spiritless one, considering the advantages it promised, and that it was made by an organized and a victorious foe against a broken and retreating one, was checked. The assailants actually retired, and if they afterward renewed the movement, they encountered none but our dead and wounded. The battle as a battle was at an end, but there was still some slaughtering that it was possible to occur before nightfall. As the wreck of our brigade drifted back through the forest, we met the brigade, Gibson's, which had the attack been made in column, as it should have been, would have been but five minutes behind our heels, with another five minutes behind its own. As it was, just 45 minutes had elapsed, during which the enemy had destroyed us, and was now ready to perform the same kindly office for our successors. Neither Gibson nor the brigade, which was sent to his relief, as tardily as he to ours accomplished, or could have hoped to accomplish anything whatever. I did not know their movements, having other duties, but Hazen, in his narrative of military service, says, I witnessed the attack of the two brigades following my own, and none of these troops advanced nearer than 100 yards of the enemy's works. They went in at a run, and his organizations were broken in less than a minute. Nevertheless, their losses were considerable, including several hundred prisoners taken from a sheltered place, whence they did not care to rise and run. The entire loss was about 1,400 men, of whom nearly one half fell killed and wounded in Hazen's brigade in less than 30 minutes of actual fighting. General Johnson says, The Federal dead lying near our line were counted by many persons, officers, and soldiers. According to these accounts, there were 700 of them. This is obviously erroneous, though I have not the means at hand to ascertain the true number. I remember that we were astonished at the uncommonly large proportion of dead to wounded, a consequence of the uncommonly close range at which most of the fighting was done. The action took its name from a water power mill nearby. This was on a branch of a stream having, I'm sorry to say, the prosaic name of Pumpkin Vine Creek. I have my own reasons for suggesting the name of the water course be altered to Sunday School Run. So we have an interesting account from Ambrose Bierce. You can tell he's he's really poetic in kind of how he writes here, obviously. is a, a little bit difficult to read, I should say. Hopefully I did a good job. But the interesting takeaways that I want to point out here are that, you know, we're, we're kind of getting away from having the bayonet and, and carrying a fortified position with a bayonet being a viable option, right? We're finding that out in the main theater of the war that, you're just not going to be able to take a fortified position with a frontal assault, especially if your enemy has time to fortify, right? The, you get very good at digging earthworks if you have to do it frequently and if it's going to save your life, right? So the Confederates, the Union Army, both sides are going to be pretty good at making them, and you're just not going to be able to charge, uh, and especially with the modern weaponry, be able to hold the position. Now, I've been to Pickett's Mill, and it is a pretty interesting place there's well-preserved earthworks there there's not really a whole lot in the atlanta campaign to go and see but these are good ones that you can go and it is a pretty hard position that you can see even in the modern day you can see it would be a hard position to take so that's another thing that i want to point out in that beers is really highlighting the fact that they got pretty close hazen's brigade did and remember he had been an aide with hazen and we had mentioned that even back in previous campaigns. So obviously the men in this brigade having gotten that close, he's pretty proud of that. And then there's always these accounts of, you know, time is always different in the Civil War. Counting casualties is always slightly different. It's actually really more kind of like a, whoa, that's pretty cool how they get it accurate than not. But it's always exaggerated. So Johnson has something to say about how he inflicts a lot of casualties and That's another takeaway that I want the last takeaway here from this account is that Johnson does try and and Hood does try as well to really justify his actions. Johnson, during the defensive part of the campaign, he really wants to throw it out there. They're like, hey, I'm I'm really whittling down attrition wise the army. And then when we get to Hood, he's going to be more offensive minded. 
and he's going to exaggerate about how the attacks go. So they're going to go in his records better than they actually do, and he's not going to sustain as many casualties. So we have two generals who are going to be at odds after the war, and we kind of see their different perspectives and why they kind of exaggerate just a little bit. With the two victories at New Hope Church and Pickett's Mill under his belt, Johnson had wished to try to maybe try the weakened Union right flank. It was possible this flank was weakened by the shifting of troops. His men would probe in the vicinity of Dallas under bait. Black Jack Logan of McPherson's command would meet the rebels on May 28th and deal bait and Frank Armstrong's dismounted cavalry several casualties. Logan himself would have to call for a counterattack from the 6th Iowa, however, who pushed out Armstrong's cavalry. The battle cost probably Confederates and casualties some 1,500, compared to a couple hundred for the Union Army. Sherman decided to move on from his idea of battering against the well-entrenched rebels. Alatoona Pass was captured by Stoneman's cavalry, and Frank Blair was ready to come down from Rome, Georgia. He could flank his enemy yet again. Johnson would retreat as well, this time forming up on some mountains, the largest of which was Kennesaw, just outside Marietta. Sherman is going to pause and resupply. The armies arriving in the vicinity around June 9th. While Sherman is satisfied with his gains at the cost of very little, we should consider the situation for the Confederacy. To the south, it seemed like Johnson was losing. Taylor had turned Banks away, and Lee was getting the better of Grant, seemingly at the wilderness in Spotsylvania. But importantly, they had not really lost any of these battles, with the exception of Dallas. The morale that was lost at Chattanooga was returning, which would be important, although to Davis and his advisor Bragg, Johnson is going to be on the clock. It is really important to talk about how there are events happening and kind of line them up, right? You know, around this time, we had the Red River campaign having broken down. We just kind of talked about that in a previous episode, right? That's campaign is pretty much over then you also have at the same time you have the overland campaign so by the time you have Rusaka, you really have fought the battle of Spotsylvania you probably have the Harris farm portion of that fighting yet to do but the battle is pretty much over and then you're going to move down to in the latter stages of what we've been talking about with our Dallas New Hope Church you're moving down to the North Anna so that's happening at the same time as well There are several sources who like to point out that while Grant is moving through Virginia, he stays at a civilian home, and they talk about how Sherman's never going to capture Rome, Georgia, and then they, while they're there, they get the confirmation that he has, in fact, captured Rome, Georgia, and so you see that in a lot of different sources. So that's what's happening at the same time. You know, you see Robert E. Lee having to give up ground, much in the same way that Johnson does, but he is at least really punch in Grant in the nose, whereas Johnson is not. But on the flip side of that, Lee is going to be able to be reinforced by PGT Beauregard, his action at Drury's Bluff over during the course of the dates that we just talked about here. So he's at least going to get some numbers back into his army, whereas Johnson just simply isn't. There's going to be some slight reinforcement that's going to come from Alabama, but that's really going to be it. He's just going to have his army and he's going to have militia, and he's not really going to be able to count on the militia, right, as much, just kind of sit in defenses and whatnot. So we kind of see it from a lot of different angles, how it is kind of positive. You got the McClellan kind of aspect of it, like we're not losing a whole lot of men, but again, we are actually still retreating, and even the rank and file write about how they're kind of tired of retreating. So there's a lot of different perspectives that you get when you research the campaign. But keep in mind that at this point, foreign intervention is off the table. So if you're Jefferson Davis, if you're Braxton Bragg as his military advisor, you're really hoping to have a huge success that's going to turn the tide of the election that's going to be coming up in November. And if you keep giving up ground to Sherman, seemingly that's not going to happen. So keep that in mind as we move forward here in future episodes talking about the Atlanta campaign. So we're going to leave the Atlanta campaign right there. I think so far when covering this campaign, you might be surprised to see there's not a whole lot of major battles. 
especially when compared to Grant in the East. This is very much a campaign of maneuver. Sherman is going to continue his drive on Atlanta in a future episode, but for now he has covered a lot of ground and needs to resupply, especially as his lines become more stretched. I think too, for this podcast, we might need to resupply, having done some pretty heavy lifting here in the last couple episodes. But fear not, we're going to push forward, because next week we'll head back to Virginia for some cavalry action at Trevilian Station, as well as pop out to Mississippi to check back in with Nathan Bedford Forrest. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posting in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the journal update for the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback's always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>